Okay, welcome to CS4510. Uh, I think this is 7 2, and this is on the halting problem. So, again, let's give some history. There was this David Hilbert at the turn of the century. He, he formulated uh, several mathematical open questions he wanted solved, and one of them was called the Ent. If this is in German, so I'm just going to write it this one time. Schid problem, which is German for decision uh, problem. So both Alan Turing and um, Alonzo Church solved this problem. And they independently, they, uh, Alan Turing developed Turing machines to solve this problem, and uh, Alonzo Church developed lambda calculus. So, what this problem, this problem can be formulated in many ways. Uh, here's one way of saying it: is every uh, problem solvable? It's sort of a big question. That's a very sort of philosophical and grand so is there an algorithm to solve every problem And sort of to tie it back into a language idea, uh, is every language decidable? So do there exist undecidable languages? So Hilbert was part of this like school of formalists who believed that uh, this to be one of the most important questions like the best question you can do in mathematics right this is like can everything be done and if so give a way to do everything and then it turns out alan turing said uh no you can't do everything so it's false there exists undecidable languages there are problems you cannot solve, and not only can you not solve them, you can prove that you can't solve them. So we can actually give two arguments in favor of uh, the false answer to this question. First, we're going to use something called Cantor's Theorem. Um, this just says that there does not exist an onto function from the naturals to the reals. Right? Basically, uncountable languages exist. By bijection, you could replace n and r with any uncountable set and any countable set, right? There is no way to map a countable set to an uncountable set in an onto manner. This implies, uh, for any possible f you would try, uh, that there exists uh, real numbers where uh, f inverse of, I don't know, R. So basically, you take the real number and you see what number it would have matched to is not defined. So the stronger version of this theorem, by the way, says that you cannot, there is no uh, onto function which maps a set S to its power set. And then that establishes that this that the uh, cardinality of a set is always is strictly less than the cardinality of its power set for all sets. So we can use this to, uh, and we can combine this with the Church Turing thesis to get uh, existence of undecidable languages. So first off, how many Turing machines are there? So let uh, T M be a set 
be the set of all uh, Turing machines. Uh, consider the function from uh, TM TM to uh, sigma star uh, such that uh, f of it takes a Turing machine and it just gives the encoding of the Turing machine. That's it. So just the encoding. The encoding is a string, right? So what this implies then is that the image of the uh, set of all Turing machines is a set of strings. It's an infinite set of strings, but it's still a set of strings. It is a subset, therefore, of a countable set. So this implies that the set of Turing machines is countable. Now, so we have a we have the fact that the set of Turing machines is countable. So what about the set of all possible languages? So first off, just to be clear, sigma star uh, is countable. Any subset of it is countable. I'm not asking for the sub for a subset of sigma star. I'm asking for the set of all possible subsets of sigma star, right? I could wave my hands and say by the stronger theorem, by the stronger version of Cantor's theorem, that uh, since uh, sigma star is countable, that implies that uh, two to the sigma star power set of sigma star is uncountable right that should that has to follow immediately or I could give you a construction so what I'm going to do is prove uh, prove uh, 2 to the sigma star is uncountable so consider any set uh, a it's a subset of sigma star. Then, what is A? A is an infinite subset of an infinite set. So we can uh, consider this function. Consider, consider, uh, I'll say G because I said F earlier. Consider uh, G, which takes the subsets of sigma star to an infinite uh, string, which we proved, by the way, these are uncountable. So this should give us a bijection, right? We want this to be a bijection. So such that uh, G of A is equal to, it's going to be a string, right? So uh, the ith digit, I'll, I'll write it this way. Ith digit of uh, g of a is equal to 1 if uh, ith string is in a and 0 if ith string is in a complement. So what is the ith string uh, where ith uh, string is the ith string of uh, sigma star alexographically. So basically, uh, sigma right is equal sigma star. Excuse me, is equal to right. If we wrote it in order, this would be epsilon zero one zero 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 one uh, and so on. Right. So this would be the first, this would be the second, this would be the third, this would be the fourth, this would be the fifth. So what we have then is uh, a, we convert every set to, it's called a characteristic. Uh, 
a characteristic uh, sequence of uh, a set. This is sometimes how it's denoted. So obviously, G is G is bijective, right? Um, we could prove it if G of A equals G of B. Then there's then the the sequences are exactly the same, so then the elements have to be exactly the same. So this obviously then implies that if the elements of these two sets are exactly the same, there's nothing missing from one that would be in the other. Uh, then that implies that they have to be the same, right? Similarly, it's onto. Any if you take any sequence, I can always reconstruct the set just by choosing the elements by uh, looping through it, right? So, this implies that uh, the set of all possible languages uh, is uncountable. But, by Cantor's theorem, uh, there are more languages than Turing machines. There are infinitely more languages than Turing machines. Uh, so there exist languages which cannot be decided by a Turing machine. If you consider... Um, I'll say F again. F takes a Turing machine to a language such that uh, F of M equals uh, the language decided by M. Uh, there always exists uh, L uh, such that F inverse of L uh, does not exist. There is no Turing machine to decide certain languages. So this is a sort of counting argument, a sort of set theoretic argument about why uh, undecidable languages exist. But can I give you uh, actual languages which not exist? I'm going to give you now uh, an actual problem which cannot be decided. First thing to make a small comment is there's a difference between a machine and its encoding, right? If M is a machine, the encoding of M is just a string. It's just a way that the machine is represented on a piece of paper. So there's nothing really stopping you from running a machine on encodings of other machines. It's very similar to how compilers can compile their own source code. I mean, they can take their code and produce themselves that as output. It's less complicated than that, though. I could decide a Turing machine, which takes in encodings of other Turing machines and determines if they have exactly 17 states or things like this, right? So we can run machines on other machines. So consider the language uh, L such that it's a pairs of encodings M comma W such that... Uh, I won't call this halt, actually. I'll call this... It's name, we'll start naming languages. So it's the encoding of a machine M and a word W such that uh, M halts on W. 
So if you can decide membership of this language, you can decide if a machine uh, halts or not, right? Basically, you could say, okay, I'm going to run M on W and then just see if it halts. That's a flawed argument we'll discuss later. But uh, suppose to the contrary, uh, halt was decidable. Uh, then this implies there exists a decider for it, a Turing machine to decide it. So let uh, let this little magic box here. We'll call this H. Let's call it H. Let's suppose H decides. Um, this language. So what it takes as input, I'm drawing this sort of like a circuit. I could draw it, I could write this mathematically, but I think this is a much clearer explanation. So this takes as input M and W, and it always outputs yes or no. Always. It's a decider. It always says yes or no. So this is the yes wire, and this is the no wire. So it always says one or the other. Suppose to the contrary that this machine exists. Okay. Then I claim I can construct the following machine, which uses H as a subroutine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this like another bigger socket, uh, a bigger uh, circuit. Something like this. So this machine is going to take us input. Uh, same thing, M comma W. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to just wire it up to the machine in a funny way. We'll use uh, dashed lines. So on input m dob comma w, our machine is going to ask h uh, to run it, right? And we'll call this machine m. So it takes the pair, it runs it on h. Then if h says yes, we're going to put it into an infinite loop. So you can think of it just like a while true machine. You could come up with a Turing machine which does not halt, right? I believe in you. Uh, so if it says yes, we're going to go here. If it says no, we're going to return that. That's all this machine does. Now I want you to run M on M. So we're going to run M on M. What this means is we're going to do like M of the machine on itself. We're running the machine on its own encoding. Okay, so let's follow what happens. Suppose we're going through here, it goes through here, it goes through each, either of these uh, wires, if this halts or it doesn't halt. So if uh, H says uh, M on M halts then loop right so if it says we halt if the machine says it halts it's actually not going to halt we're going to an infinite loop we're explicitly not halting if h says m on input m uh loops i'll say doesn't halt doesn't halt we halt so if h says no this machine this is not going to halt on this input we immediately halt so it's a contradiction for both cases it's the exact opposite of what we say we're going to do therefore uh therefore h cannot exist That implies that the halting problem is undecidable. This language cannot be decided. There is no way to determine with absolute certainty that you can... There is no way to solve this problem. That's kind of sort of grandiose in my opinion. And there's already immediate applications to this 
uh, in like if you're a programmer and use an IDE and you wonder well, how come my uh, why can't my IDE tell me if I run into an infinite loop or not well this is a this is a good reason why it, it's never going to be able to always be correct if it's going to say oh look you have an infinite loop there no matter how complex that algorithm is there will always be cases where that will that algorithm will fail okay uh, now I'm going to prove existence of a recognizable languages which is not decidable first I'll prove that uh, if uh, a and a complement are uh, recognizable Turing recognizable this is true if and only if uh, a is decidable so well let's prove it the backwards direction by the way is a little obvious if a is decidable then it's recognizable a decidable language is closed under complement so a complement should also be recognizable that direction is uh, obvious let's do the more interesting forward direction uh, let uh, a a complement be a uh, Turing uh, recognizable so then there then there exists uh, M1, M2 to recognize, but not necessarily decide, uh, A and A complement. Uh, consider machine M. So what we're going to do uh, is, is I'll draw it again like a circuit because I think that's kind of nice. Let this machine be M1. Let this machine uh, be m2 and consider the machine m i'm going to draw it like this uh such that on input w it's going to run uh the machines m1 and m2 uh in parallel so well how can you run it in parallel? What you really do is you alternate. You say, I'm running, I simulate M1 for one step. I go and I simulate M2 for one step. I simulate M1 again for one step. I simulate M2 for one step. And now I accept uh, only if M1 accepts. And I reject only if M2 rejects. So simulate M1, M2 in parallel alternation, alternation. Uh, M accepts if M1 accepts. Actually, this is a mistake. It's here. So M accepts if M1 accepts. M rejects if uh, M2 accepts. Right, because M2 is the decider for a complement. So here's the proof, the quick proof of correctness. Uh, every language is in a set or its complement, right? So every word is in a set or its complement, right? Uh, then, because we have recognizers for these languages, W will either, M will always accept or reject. So M is a decider. Okay. So, now what I'm going to do is 
prove that uh, halt is uh, we proved halt is not decidable, but I'm going to prove that it is recognizable. So halt is not decidable, but is recognizable. So what's the way you do this? You just say uh, on input uh, m comma w uh, simulate uh, m on w. That's it. You just run the machine on the on the word, and because it's a recognizer, this will accept only if m halts on w. So if it's in the language, we can always determine it. If M accepts W, just by running it, we know it'll accept W. Ah, but if M is not in W, we don't know if it'll reject or if it'll loop forever. We have no idea. Uh, but halt is not decidable. Right? But this is a quick argument that it is recognizable. What that implies then is that the complement of halt uh, cannot be are recognizable. So we have existence of a problem which is not recognizable. If it, halt was recognizable, if complement of halt was recognizable, then halt would be recognizable by this construction. Complement of halt would be recognizable by assumption. Therefore, halt would be decidable uh, by the theorem we just proved. But halt is not decidable. We proved that. So halt complement cannot be recognizable. So I finally have been building this up for several months i can finally give you a somewhat complete picture of our universe we have you know regular languages all right a little bigger we have context-free languages we have decidable languages We have recognizable languages. That was the worst. So now we have languages which are recognizable and not decidable, right? We have languages which are context, which are decidable and not context-free. We have context-free languages which are not regular. Now we have recognizable languages, which are not decidable, and we have languages which are not recognizable. So we have this hierarchy here. This is part of what's called the Chomsky hierarchy of uh, computational power. And then we finally reached a sort of like a, a, a horizon, right? So there are things which we can't know. There are things which we can sort of know, and there are things for certain we certainly we can know. But it's a, it's a cool classification of of. It's not that we, it's not enough that we don't know it, but we know we can't know it, which makes it kind of worse. So to give these examples, we here we have halt uh, complement. Here we have halt. Uh, here we have something like uh, one to the n squared. Here we have something like 0 to the n, 1 to the n, and here we have something like, uh, I don't know, 1 to the n, right? 